about how we are using Google Earth Engine to support malaria forecasting. This is part of a long-running project, Epidemia, the goal of which is to develop and implement an early warning system, a malaria early warning system that integrates public health data with, um, survey, with data about environmental drivers. Uh, and we're looking at environmental drivers for malaria because malaria is uh, spread by mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are affected by the habit, uh, by the environment. For example, water affects their breeding habitats, the temperature, their life cycle, biting behaviors, and such like. Once we have both sets of data, these are fed into the rest of the forecasting system, which is based in R. Uh, our own R package R that has generic and flexible disease modeling and forecasting functions and a custom R project to tie everything together and supply all the details and local settings of a particular implementation. Uh, for example, the Amhara region of Ethiopia. So why are we using Google Earth Engine? We needed something that could be used by our public health colleagues who may not uh, have a background in coding or remote sensing and who might have technical challenges with internet bandwidth and reliability in Ethiopia for downloading full satellite imagery wasn't feasible. So we turned to Google Earth Engine for cloud computing. Uh, we wrote a script that can be used in the code editor, which I've also turned into an app as an alternative where they can quickly download small CSV files of daily environmental data that is already summarized per worida, uh, per district. Someone else on the project is looking at developing a custom Python package so that we can, from R, call GEE via Python. It'll be for our own use, but we plan to include it in our public demo as well. And then linking it all together is that uh, a custom R project for the specific implementation. It pulls together the location, the surveillance data, the downloaded environmental data together with all the user settings for the location specific modeling. Uh, and finally, also produces formatted forecasting reports uh, like the live Amhara reports you can see off on the right side here. We had been producing their reports starting in 2015 uh, and after redevelopment of the system, their local team took ownership of generating the Amhara reports in 2018. Epidemia can also do model validation, which we think would be particularly important in places where the disease system could be changing, say due to the malaria elimination efforts, uh, where you may want to check in on your modeling choices over time. Uh, everything's on our GitHub site, uh, but a major change is coming mid-June uh, update, and we are also looking at possible scale up from one region to all regions in Ethiopia. All right, that's all I had for you. Thank you very much, Don. Are there any questions from the audience? If you have a question, please feel free to type it in the chat. Okay, um, I don't see I don't see any questions, but um, I have one for you, Don. Oh, sure. So um, I know that you've also been working with. Um, local government officials, people on the ground who are uh, interested in these maps that you're creating. Um, do you yes. have any, any takeaways from like working with people who will be using data and maps that you generate that you can share with us? Oh, well, it's, it's been an, an iterative process, you know, talking with them, getting their feedback on what is useful for them on the ground, uh, and then trying to incorporate that back into the uh, reports. I mean, the reports that you can see now have been through months and several rounds of improvement on what they want to see in the maps and the graphs um, and how they want data presented. Uh, so, it, I mean, you talk with them because if you give them something that they're not going to use, then they're not going to be interested in it. And it's not going to be worth anyone's time. <laughs> Absolutely. They are, they are in a way the customers after all. Yes. So we, we have a few questions coming in, um, but in the interest of time, I'm going to keep an eye on these questions, but we're going to keep going and we'll come back to them in the general Q&A session. So, Sounds like a plan. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Don. And next up, we have um, Andrea, who will be telling us about the mapping, uh, mapping building density with planet scope imagery. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Um, so my project is related to what Dawn just presented. Uh, so in her study, she predicts malaria outbreaks in all these districts in the Amhara region in Ethiopia. Um, but now the public health officials have shared sub-district data with us. Uh, those are weekly um, malaria case numbers that we get from health posts within these districts. So I'm working in four districts of what Don just presented, and I study the sub-district variability of malaria cases. And um, yeah, we assume that the, envi uh, the environmental drivers at this sub-district level are different from what Dawn used in her model for the entire region. So here in this middle map, um, those are two districts zoomed into. And you can see that, yeah, we have quite the variation of where the malaria hotspots are within a district. And then when we look at um, something like mean temperatures, we can see that this gradient doesn't really show up in the malaria pattern. So what works for Dawn's large scale model might not be applicable if we try to get that to a much smaller scale. And yeah, one of the, uh, one of the aspects, I should make that smaller. Um, one of the aspects that we assume that influences those small scale differences is building density. So do people live in little huts close to their fields or do people live in cities and commute to work in the big irrigation scheme where maybe nobody lives in those irrigation areas? So to figure out the settlement density, I've downloaded a bunch of planet scope imagery at three meter resolution. And um, I did all the pre-processing in Google Colab. Uh, I've done that in, in those Colab not notebooks because the planet for uh, planet scope people they actually provide python codes that makes it easier for their users and then um yeah once i've done that i pulled all the reflectance images into qgis and that is where i um then also with the um, google earth plugin i drew my trailing polygons for the building and the non-building areas yeah and then came the point where i moved it all into google earth engine so with all the imagery and the training points um, that I added as assets, I then trained a random forest classifier and then applied the classifier. So I get the map in the middle that, um, that shows these pink pixels, pixels that are classified as buildings. So here these denser areas where we have cities and out here some like individual buildings in the rural site. But yeah, I'm not interested in how many buildings there are or how many building pixels. I'm more interested in how densely clustered they are. And then, so then I applied a kernel density estimation um, that is here on the right. So the more pixels are next to each other, the higher the density value is. Um, so yeah, in, in those lo lonely huts out in the, my mouse disappeared. Yeah, those lonely huts out in the fields, they get relatively low values. And then there are these areas where there's no building at all that would all have zero values. And yeah, that's pretty much all I've done so far. And now I'll move ahead and add this settlement index. Yeah, I have the settlement index now of the density in each uh, of those sub-district areas. And I'll add that to my, to my overall variables and then see if, if this settlement index statistically explains some of the patterns that we're seeing. Yeah, and I think that was three minutes already. So if you have Thank any you questions, so much. let me know. Yes, we have one question here from TC. Is the mean temperature map based on surface temperature from satellites or air temperature from ground measurements? Yeah, this is, um, this is satellite based temperatures. Okay, and since that was such a short question, there's one more from um, Matt Payne. What image pre-processing do you apply to planet scope? Um, that was mostly uh, like removing clouds, checking that there aren't any clouds in the images, um, and then uh, yeah, converting radiance values to uh, top of top of atmosphere reflectance values. 
Thank you so much again, Andrea. Yeah, this was no a great problem. presentation. And now we will turn the time over to um, Qiu Sheng Wu, who will be sharing on using the GMAP Python package for interactive mapping with Earth Engine. Okay. Can you share my screen? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Chu Sun Wu. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the University of Tennessee. And today I'm going to give you a brief introduction about a Python package that I developed during the past few weeks. And you can access my PowerPoint uh, slide using the QR code at the uh, lower right corner here, or you can just type uh, gishub.org uh, slash meetup. And I will also post my slides on Twitter later. So, um, and let's get started. So this is the outline. I will give you a brief introduction and then show you how to install the package and also show you some resources and tutorials how to um, get started. So uh, first of all, um, uh, GE map is basically a package for interactive mapping uh, with Earth Engine. Uh, when I first started using Earth Engine Python API, it was a um, little bit challenging because it's not as intuitive as the uh, JavaScript uh, co-editor. You can only print out some thumbnail. You cannot really visualize the data layers interactively. So, um, and I developed this package basically just to make it more uh, intu intuitive for Python users to use the Earth Engine. And it's primarily depends on uh, IPy leaflet and Folium. So, and also it runs on Jupyter Notebook and Google Colab. But I would like to point out that um, Google Colab right now does not support IPy leaflet yet. So it might support in the future, but uh, you can use uh, GE map if you're only running the computation. If you don't need to display the map, then you can use uh, uh, Google Colab. Otherwise you need to run on Jupyter um, in order to do the mapping. So you can install using pip, uh, Conda, or you can install from GitHub. And uh, because I update the package very frequently, sometimes if the functions are not available on uh, uh, pip or Conda, you can install using uh, the function called update uh, underscore package uh, to update the information. And here is the uh, YouTube tutorial. Uh, so far I have uh, created 20 tutorials and you can uh, visit the link to uh, watch the tutorial. And I also post it on my GitHub so you can have access to all the videos. Um, if you don't have time for the video, you can watch the highlights, uh, the GF animation. And each tutorial also has a Jupyter notebook. So you can link to each Jupyter notebook to see the source code that I saw in this tutorial. And um, so right now I only have 20, but if you want to learn more, I also have the other two repos. Uh, the first one with 360 Jupyter notebook examples. Uh, the other one is 300 using uh, in QGIS. So you are welcome to explore those uh, repos. And lastly here, if you have any suggestions, you can uh, open a feature request on my GitHub repo if you want to um, um, request something new. And lastly, I want to show you some key features that uh, if you're coming from JavaScript, you can um, just uh, copy and paste and then directly convert your JavaScript to uh, um, uh, Python and Jupyter Notebook. So you don't really need to convert by yourself. I have function for, for, for you to do automatic conversion. And if you have a bunch of scripts, you can also do it like a, uh, in a batch script to convert all your JavaScript to Python all at once. And you can also search and import data from the, uh, uh, um, the Earth Engine data catalog. So basically my goal is to import most of the things that you can do in the code editor to Jupyter Notebook so that you don't have to switch back and forth between those uh, two um, uh, platforms. You can also add customized lens um, that uh, this one is not available in the code editor. So you can, you can just one line of code, you can add a nice uh, uh, lesion to the map. You can also add XYZ type uh, maps or WMS. Also this one is not available on code editor and you can add a lot of these from the internet. Uh, so you have more options to use the base map. And also you can use the inspector to click and get all the uh, information. This, this one is similar to the co-editor. And lastly, you can do interactive plotting. Um, just click and then you can get um, the uh, graph for all the data layers. 
you can create animations, uh, just draw and uh, you don't need any coding, you just draw a rectangle and then you get it. And I think this is the last one, you can do a split uh, panel map and you can visualize the changes for all kinds of layers, only a, a few lines call, uh, so much easier than uh, JavaScript. And here's my contact information. Um, you're welcome to contact me via email or uh, leave a comment uh, on Twitter and or on my GitHub. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tirshan. We have a question from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, they're asking, Sunita is asking if there's a tutorial on customizing charts or axes and multiple trend lines. Yes, that one is, uh, you can customize uh, using the, the plot function. So in the plot there are, if you on the uh, uh, Jupyter notebook, you just hit uh, shift tab on your keyboard and then you bring up those parameters that you can customize. So you can customize uh, different uh, line plot or scatter plot or bar plot. You can also customize those axes like what you can do using a uh, map plot. So it's the, using the package called BQ plot. Um, I can certainly make another tutorial to show you how to uh, customize those uh, functions if, you, if needed. Thank you very much, Tushan. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pass this on now to, to Rich. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm just about to share the screen. Uh, so I'm Rich Boothroyd. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Glasgow, and I've been working on active channel change in the Philippines, so coming from a physical geography perspective. Uh, we're working on quite a large natural environment research council grant that's looking at flood risk and sediment change in the Philippines uh, with collaborators from Brunel University of London and the University of the Philippines, Diliman. And the first thing to note really is that rivers are really dynamic in the Philippines. Uh, so there's lots of lateral, horizontal and vertical channel change. An example here from the Cagayan River using Landsat satellite imagery and annual image collection. You can see meander expansion and uh, meander cutoff processes confluences migrating downstream and then dancing river channels. So here an example from the Abelbrook River, uh, the connection and disconnection of rivers, uh, real large meandering processes. And it's really important to look at the river as a, a wider river envelope, not just the water in the river channel, but also the, the deposit of sediment and the riparian vegetation as well. So it's thinking about the river as the wider river scape, including water, sediment, and vegetation. So I've been using Google Earth Engine to really try and look at active channel change. So taking all available Landsat and Sentinel imagery, uh, breaking that down and cloud masking to produce annual composite images, and then trying to classify the wetted part of the channel from the alluvial sediment deposits. So we can start to get the mask for the, the wet channel, start to get the mask for the alluvial sediment deposits, merge those together and produce quite simple binary masks that cover the, the annual channel. The next step taking that forward is then to look at how the channel is changing through time. So using those binary image masks to look at active channel change and trying to evaluate and quantify the rates of change for these large river systems. So you can see uh, meander cutoff here, and change in that center line. So we can start to evaluate that through time for different scales of reaches. And the work that most recently I've been doing is trying to apply that over the full extent of the Philippines using the large river systems. An example here for a 150 kilometer stretch, and we can start to quantify a reach average to erosion rate of just how much the river is changing. So trying to see hotspots of erosion and seeing why the river isn't changing quite so much. And so just to zoom in on a couple of those zones, we can see large scale changes on the annual time scale every sort of one to five years, um, erosion rates of 200 meters. So lots of land is being lost to river lateral erosion. Uh, so the next step is really to integrate more of the Sentinel data um, and then to extend that across the full extent of the Philippines. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Rich. That was a beautiful presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, we have a question from Melda. Were the plots made in GEE? 
that was exported to MATLAB for the plots. So taking the binary masks and exporting to MATLAB. So not at the moment. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, there's another question here. Um, since that was such a quick one, could we map water quality in rivers? Yes, I think so. Lots of people have been looking at suspended sediment um, and the turbidity, so the colour of the water, and that's a good way to assess water quality. So that can be done at sort of national scale or even global scale, so that's possible. Excellent. Thank you so much again. Thank and you. now we'll turn the screen over to TC, who will be sharing with us on estimating COVID-19 presence at fine resolutions in the US. Hello everyone, uh, let me share my screen. Um, so, uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm TC, I'm a PhD candidate at Yale, and I'm also a geospatial consultant at the Yale Library, and I've been working on the Yale COVID-19 data mapping project. So kind of a background about the project. So a couple, like with the start of the pandemic, uh, so the Yale School of Medicine basically led uh, Yale-wide collaboration of different researchers working on the COVID-19 uh, uh, issue. And one of the big projects was creating interactive visualizations and doing some spatial data analysis of the different data sources available. So we started with some of the stuff which you have probably seen from other groups, like we have like a global dashboard. Um, we have a US case density map, and uh, then we move to a more of a, a regional, like um, state level data. So we have uh, a similar dashboard for Connecticut, including the city uh, level data. And then we also have time lapses of the spread of the disease, uh, of both at the global scale and uh, at the US and Connecticut scale. Uh, and you, you can see a list of all of the different mapping projects we are currently involved in, uh, in that link. Uh, so one of the more interesting projects I've been involved in is mapping COVID presence at very high resolutions, because one of the issues with using administrative boundaries is that people don't live equally distributed in those boundaries. Plus, the disease doesn't really care about administrative boundaries as such. So what we basically did was we took county level confirmed cases uh, and then using the world pop 100 meter by 100 meter uh, population estimates, we basically disaggregate the, the data. Uh, so what you basically get is essentially the probability of the number of people uh, infected with the disease at that resolution. Of course, we sh you shouldn't be using single pixel data for this kind of analysis or to make decisions, but it does give you a better understanding of the, the wider trend of the disease than looking at geographic uh, levels of aggregation. I think some people will ask the question, is this just a population density map? Well, almost, but not quite, because we are normalizing it by the total number of cases in each of these uh, um, counties. So here, this is just like a, was a video of the, uh, one of the uh, Earth Engine apps we created to kind of visualize and explore the data set. Similar to that, we have uh, one for, uh, sorry, we have one for Connecticut as well. With Connecticut, the advantage is that we have town level data. So we have better, uh, uh, like higher resolution data, plus probably less variability in the te testing rate versus comparing across the whole country. Uh, but similar to the other one, you basically can see a COVID presence index for each of these pixels. And also we have added like three day, seven day and 10 day change in the COVID presence index. So we are, uh, currently working on a few other projects and kind of using multiple platforms, including Earth Engine. Uh, one which is supposed to be released soon is the uh, basically uh, accessibility to testing locations using more like raster analysis versus looking at geographic uh, units of aggregation. And that's kind of where we are at the moment. Uh, I uh, Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, TC. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, Keiko asks, is it updated automatically? No, not at this moment. I, I mean, uh, I guess the issue is with Earth Engine apps, I mean, I would have to move to Python to do it automatically, but it doesn't take that much, that long to update. Uh, so you just run it every day 
and then uh, change the link to the uh, asset. Thank you, TC. This was really impressive. And now we'll turn the screen over to Christina, who's also going to be showing an app um, on how she has mapped pollution during the COVID-19 epidemic. Hi, everyone. Okay. Um, is it visible? Uh, not yet. Okay, I think now it should work. So, hi, everyone. Um, if it's all right, if it's visible. Um, so I'm going to talk about mapping pollution during the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, this is a very light talk, it's not very scientific. I've done this exercise in Google Earth Engine mostly for um, teaching myself on how to work on the uh, Google Earth Engine and also for understanding how can I uh, pass this information to other people as well. So, oh, okay. So the idea came when uh, the pandemic actually exploded uh, in China. I've seen like this uh, applications everywhere uh, about how uh, emissions have dropped in uh, all parts of China that were uh, quarantined. And then when the epidemic was transferred back to uh, Europe, uh, it also came into our attention. Uh, so there are a couple of examples uh, over the internet that uh, kind of uh, picked uh, for me and I thought that this is a very good idea this is a very simple exercise that we can do and we can use um, Sentinel 5P that is currently uh, in uh, Google Earth Engine to, to do a quick visualization of, uh, of the data and see, see how it's uh, going on in Northern Italy. So I've done a very quick uh, um, exercise on how to, how to map this uh, uh, drop in emissions in Northern Italy specifically. I'm very attached to the area because I've been there for quite a long while. And uh, it was dramatic to see how, um, how a very polluted area uh, quickly dropped into emissions. So the, the application itself includes near real-time data from Google Earth Engine. That's because at the beginning, I wished to, to map what's happening every single day against uh, the prior period. Apparently, a better idea is to map uh, what's happening in uh, each year. So in 2019 for the same period and 2020 for the same period. Um, and then I received some very good comments over Twitter about uh, using cloud filtering. Uh, so I think uh, some of you have already uh, this question prepared. Uh, I have not looked into it for this exercise necessarily, but uh, I did uh, put it on a, on a list of things that I would like to do. Uh, I didn't think that for educational purposes is really necessary uh, as long as this is not a scientific, I'm not an atmospheric uh, scientist, so um, definitely not going to teach you on how to interpret the data, but mostly on how to use Google Earth Engine. So it has a couple of quick basic functionality such as flight locations, so if you want to look at other locations around the world, uh, comparison between 2019 and 2020, and uh, it can constitute the basis for your project. And actually, I've been very pleased to see many other projects that were similar um, around Twitter mostly, and some of them are gorgeous, some of them are amazing. Um, one of them is also citing me, so Justin Bratton also um, mm -hmm. used a couple of things uh, that I've done in my application. That was a very nice surprise. Uh, and also, I've seen some uh, other applications uh, related, not that are not exactly what I've done, but something very, very uh, similar to other parts of the world or uh, that have a different approach. So I encourage you to actually check this all. I'll post the, the slides on Twitter as well uh, for you to, to have the links. So uh, I wanted to mention that some of them um, uh, also went forward, um, further and they developed their own applications. 
uh, and this can only make me very happy because the whole purpose of this exercise was educational. And the, uh, over Twitter, I, I just looked uh, a little bit and I've seen like this tweet where uh, it was mentioning that this uh, constituted the basis for somebody that tried to learn something new. So that's really fulfilling my heart. And uh, just as a conclusion, I think this is a very nice, uh, if you are going into Sentinel 5P, uh, I would be reluctant to say this is uh, necessarily science if you don't uh, have um, a very good in-depth uh, information about the data. If you're not an atmospheric scientist, uh, I'm not, but I encourage everybody to play and learn a lot. And also uh, be careful on when you make assumptions because uh, uh, there is much information on the internet on how to use this data, but sometimes it's misused. And my case could have been as uh, um, a slight misuse because I did conf um, confuse emissions with pollutions, <laughs> and uh, that uh, that was a uh, kind of a backlash at some point. But anyway, uh, thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, I am more than happy to to talk um, about. Thank you, Christina. I think your presentation is also a great example of science communication and how you can encourage people to learn new things by showing them how it's done. So thank you so much for making thank that you. tutorial as well. And we have a question here from the audience. Amilat asks, why do you think NO2 would give you a good impression to compare pollution at different times? Are there other um, parameters at Sentinel-5P that can be used for air pollution measurement? And then as well. um, mm -hmm. So yes, uh, NO2, it's very common because uh, it's a very good indicator of what comes out uh, as emissions from industrial activities or traffic activities. Uh, so it's very, um, it does have like a, a very uh, good um, presence in the atmosphere. So it's, uh, it can persist for a couple of uh, hours to days. So it's uh, one of the quickest things to, to, to map when you're looking at, uh, and the best things to map when you're looking at uh, emissions that can um, be perceived as pollution. Uh, there are certain other gases as well. Uh, CO2 is one of them, but unfortunately, uh, Sentinel-5P only looks at um, uh, carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide specifically. So. Uh, there are other sensors that, are, as far as I know, they're not included in, uh, in Google Earth Engine, but uh, maybe will be included in the future. Um, but uh, you can look at other, other um, indicators of pollution as well, such as um, aerosols, uh, particles. It's, it's a very broad discussion. I'm not an atmospheric scientist, and I don't want to, to, to try to uh, explain things that I'm not very, um, very uh, good at. But uh, I, I think that uh, when you're playing with this data, you can actually learn a lot about the science behind it as well, so you can train yourself. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Christina. And now we're going to turn the time over to Keiko, who will show us um, simple visualization with Earth Engine apps. Hey everyone, I'm trying to share a screen, but it says uh, I cannot. Oh, okay. I think now I can. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see familiar names among participants and of course speakers. Um, so today I'm going to show how to publish a map online. So this is assuming um, you have a map online. <laughs> I mean, so you have a map in a raster or GeoTIFF and you are seeing in some kind of GIS software, but you want to move this to online because you don't want to expect people to have GIS software or download a large file. So website is still an um, excellent way to show your map. And if you know that person can zoom in, zoom out, that'd be excellent. So how to do this? Well, first you have to upload your file to Earth Engine 
and I assume you've already signed up to do um, Auth Engine. And then go to Asset and click New, and then upload your asset. And when you do so, make sure to set the accessibility level. So either you're going to click anyone can read, or after you publish an app, you go back and select an app that you are going to share your file. And then what to do next? Well, this is just one of the ways. If you just want to do it very quickly, um, go to my GitHub. And then the simple one would be Lambda Cover Map JavaScript. And then copy and paste. And copy and paste works, but not so much with find and replace. So um, in order to change, you do need to read the code line by line, but hopefully those are very straightforward. There are only few lines I believe you need to change and just replace um, my file with yours and the change the name of the class or colors that you like, of course, region of interest um, and so on. Then you can pretty much quickly being able to publish online, uh, clicking app, and just follow the steps here, uh, name your app, and you have to um, link to a Google Cloud project. And again, just, just follow the steps, it's very straightforward, and click publish. And what you will get is something like this. Um, so this is a work um, I did when I was a PhD student. It's basically mapping uh, southern Myanmar, uh, focusing on oil palm and rubber plantations. And you can select particular class or any band, depending on your raster file, and uh, highlight those particular classes as well. And recently, Justin Broughton uh, published a new tutorial about adding a drawing tool. So I added that to this map as well. So what it does is you can select any area and you can get statistics out of this. So in my case, I decided to use it to get the statistics of the area by class. Um, and I created two apps. One is with um, pie chart and the other is with bar chart. So all of this is in the GitHub. Uh, feel free to take a look and copy paste. Um, yep, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Keiko. Are there any questions from the audience? Um, you have a, a comment from Tushan that says nice pie chart. So yeah, it's- Thank uh, you. Definitely a nice visualization that you included. Yeah, if anyone can also figure out how to um, correspond the colors in pie chart to the colors in the label, that would be great. It was a little bit tricky and I didn't have a lot of time, but because the area you select do not necessarily have all the six classes. So, you know, corresponding the colors you set or the map to the pie chart was tricky, but which was easier in the bar chart. Mm -hmm. There's one question from Lorena who, who asks, um, is there any limitation on the number of apps we can have on GE? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I, have, I haven't reached. <laughs> um, I haven't heard about the limit. Yeah, but I don't know. Okay, maybe we'll ask Tyler or, or Justin later on. Thank you so much, Keiko. Thank you. And now we have a presentation um, 